Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, now, now and at the, the hour of our, our death. death. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome back, guys. Um, once again, a live show. This is great. Father Marius O'Reilly uh, made the long trip over from Cork, about a half an hour. Yep. <laughs> and uh, we've had you before on the rosary. I don't know if you remember, but we did do one. Um, it was like a skype call kind of yeah. thing so guys if you haven't seen that that's father marius o'reilly on the rosary because that's your big thing we're going to get to that later hopefully but the first half of the show i'm hopefully going to get a bit into your story um you know if you were always really like desiring to be a priest if that was just on your mind your whole life or if there's a different story there and then hopefully current situation in ireland right now as a mm -hmm. catholic priest you've got your hand on the polls like you're living in Cork, and you kind of know what's going on. So hopefully that's going to be the program. Please got it. And then informally, if there's pr if they have questions that come up. Uh, so right. you're born and raised in Bishopstown. Like yes. A lot of people know Father Colum. Like you guys were literally five minutes from each other, and you didn't know each other. Wouldn't even say five minutes. I'd say about maybe 150 yards. <laughs> and you didn't I would know. have known his family. He'd be older than me, so he would have known um, my elder brother, Bernard. Um, but I would have known maybe his youngest brother, um, Ronan, who would have been maybe five years older than me. So oh, wow. there was quite a quite an age difference, I guess. But, um, but how old are you? Sorry, uh, forty five now. Just gonna say, yeah, yeah. So he's okay. he's eighty. What is he? <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, yeah, it's, he's more like that. <laughs> but we've never actually met. You know, like we've we've spoken and have we, maybe we haven't even spoken on the phone. I'm not sure, but we've certainly emailed and been in touch quite a bit. Um, We've gotten some but, good interviews on Radio Maria as well. Like yes, that's right. Have, yeah, those were very good. We did some interviews. Yeah, yeah. and he's written articles and told us to us. And um, but we've never actually met. And uh, but I had heard about one of the powers becoming a priest. Didn't know the the servant brothers at the time. So um, when you guys were coming to Ireland, and then I was putting two and two together, I was like, oh yeah, that's that's Father Colum. And so it's been really interesting to hear him on this show as well. And yeah. Hearing his great yeah, insights. That's crazy, really is. So like you're growing up, is it a typical Catholic family? Were you guys into your faith? Would you have practice? Yeah, when I was growing up in Ireland, very different to the Ireland you guys are experiencing now. I mean, when you're in school, secondary school, pretty much everyone would have gone to mass, you know, more mm -hmm. or less. It was so every family would have more or less gone to Sunday mass. Some families still maybe praying the rosary, but not many probably at that stage. Um, so we would have been, I suppose, I'm the youngest and the the nearest to me would be maybe seven years and the nearest to her would be five years. So I'm quite a bit younger than the rest of the, the family. So they had kind of left the nest when I was growing up and my father had become more religious. My mother was, was always going to mass every day. And so we began to, you know, uh, pray the rosary a bit at home. And um, my father started getting involved in the pilgrimage business as well. So I would have had exposure to Fatima and Lourdes would have gone there a few times as a, a young guy um, and gone then when I would have been 17, 18, maybe as a guide. So I was, you know, I was exposed quite a bit to religion growing up. So maybe more than the average guy. But um, I wouldn't say our family, our family was, you know, um, more involved in religion than a lot of other families. Yeah, it's or, just a normal thing, like it. Yeah, it was yeah. kind of yeah. Um, but as I suppose my father, he had a heart attack, and uh, he kind of you know started focusing more on pilgrimages and that kind of thing. And I would have had a lot of profound conversations with him, particularly around Fatima, and just loved hearing. He was a great storyteller, so he would tell me a lot of the stories growing up. And I suppose I was I was luckier than the other children in the family to be exposed to what was going on in in my father's soul at the time. Um, so that had a big influence on me. But the thought of I never I, I always remember this father. Look, I never I never desired to be a priest. You know, I never thought about becoming a priest. The thought maybe would pop into my head maybe every now and again, but it wasn't on my agenda at all. I was I was looking to be a Premier League footballer, and you know, were you good? No, not that good. <laughs> not that good. But I, I wish I was, you know. And I practiced hard, and you know, I absolutely loved 
sport. I played lots of different sports, rugby and football and hurling and the whole lot, a bit of table tennis. But I really wanted to be a professional soccer player. And, you know, that was never, I, I would have dreams of playing for Manchester United and that kind of thing. But just uh, unfortunately, it was never on the agenda. <laughs> yeah, but you're like normal lad, really. Like I'd say that's an aspiration in a lot of. Yeah, it was it was my dream. It yeah. was my dream. You know, I never, never. I never, never met a priest who inspired me. And I would have met a lot of priests, but inspired me to want to become a priest later on. You couldn't connect with them, or was just like, was it irrelevant, or um, maybe couldn't connect in a way. Yeah, maybe never met anyone who was similar to my personality, or you know, when I when I started, you know, thinking about the priesthood then, and I started tomorrow we celebrate Saint Damien of Molokai. You I mean you read that story and. Well, I mean that's yeah. so inspiring or you know I used to watch I started watching EWTN when I started you know thinking about discerning for the priesthood and I would hear priests like preaching on fire and speaking about Our Lady and Fatima and I connected with all that but there was kind of we were I suppose in Ireland it was kind of the faith was start, we were almost becoming apologetic about our faith you know there was no passion I didn't. I, I certainly didn't experience much. You say apologetic, like apologizing or like yeah, defending like, or no. Like, sorry, I suppose it, like apologizing rather than apologetic. Okay. Yeah. So that was almost, going on back in your day as well, like in the yeah. And when I was in secondary school, you know, I would have gone to a school where it was found. You know, there were some religious brothers there still, but religion class was kind of we'd watch Indiana Jones or James Bond movies. It was kind of like. Or we better, you know, fill the gap somehow with religion yeah. class, you know. And and I often think back, what a shame, because us young guys who were, you know, idealistic and if we were presented with the truth and the faith, yeah. because we were still all going to mass, so we were very much connected, um, we, we would have actually probably engaged, you know, it quite a bit. So um, we were kind of at that stage in, in Ireland where there wasn't a whole lot going on in the parishes. There was no kind of passion behind the faith um so i really wasn't being inspired much yeah no that's that's reasonable like i think that's that's pretty typical and so like through secondary school you get into college where do you go to college so i went to college in ucc okay so down the road which was handy um and i suppose i remember in secondary school going to the uh, career guidance guy and saying um you know maybe i can you let me know i mean should i be a priest you know i, I had this thought First year college? No, this would have been probably like sixth year in school, my last okay. year high school, secondary school. And he was like, because I was a bit of a messer in school and I was suspended from school and all. And he said... Um, what did you get suspended for? Is that, is that your mom's watching? <laughs> I, think was like the, I think it was like the, you know, the the straw that broke the camel's back probably, but we had a kind of a... We, we were throwing kiwis at each other in the class one day. <laughs> <laughs> guys were bringing in fruit and we were throwing at each other and I was kind of all boys school was it all boys school yeah, yeah. so um, so I was suspended for like a week but it really had a massive impact on me really it made me like take school seriously and I remember my father saying you know you've you you gotta you gotta show the teachers that you know you're you can do it and so I started studying for the first time and taking it more seriously and all that um, and then so I want my dream was to become like a, after the football dream died um, pretty early on my dream was to become like an entrepreneur business guy because my father was in business and he had a few different companies and I, that's what I really wanted to do I, and he wanted me to come into his business but I didn't want that I wanted to do my own thing and so I went to college studied business for four years in UCC and um, the thought every now and again would pop into my head about becoming a priest but my religion was kind of a bit like Nicodemus visiting the Lord at night I mean Nicodemus came up trumps right at the end okay but um, you know we see that he would visit the Lord kind of in secret at night and my relationship with the Lord was a bit like that none of my friends would have known that I would have gone to mass on Sundays or wasn't involved in any groups but the way we have groups now like U2000 and different youth groups and things they weren't really around in my time. But you'd go to Mass in UCC? Like, well, no. while you're in school in UCC, you're going to Mass on Sundays? Because I lived so near UCC, I would go to my own parish. While in college, well. While in college, yeah. So, but I never, I never, I don't think I went into the church in UCC in four years, you yeah. know. It just, because I, probably because I was afraid of what people would think. You know, I was with the guys and, you know, um, 
trying to be cool and so it wouldn't have you yeah. know I wouldn't have thought it would have been cool going into the church kind of yeah. thing so what I would have done it in secret you know when I would have been away maybe somewhere or I just wasn't uh, secure enough in myself yeah. I look back now and I can see that so clearly at the time of course I thought I was great and you know f- full of pride and what have you but I went then and did a master's in Dublin in the Smurfit Business College which would be the kind of graduate school for UCD again in, in business it was in marketing and you know got involved in you know I was doing a lot of partying and what have you um, and then I got a job in an internet company in London a dream job the company had just raised a couple of guys from California they just raised 32 million dollars Wow. And this this internet startup, this was the year 2000 when the internet, the wow, first yeah. time when the bubble was just taking off. Um, so that was the dream. So off I went to London and um, I lasted there about a year. I had met a girl just before I headed to London, about five weeks before, and got in a relationship and kind of came back to kind of uh, see would it, you know, would it go anywhere. And so... Um, was back in Dublin then for about three years and that relationship didn't work out the last, I don't know, two and a half years or something. And I had this kind of, you know, I was, I was doing well. I was working in a company in Dublin. We were, it was in the internet arena as well with the experience I'd got in London. It was very valuable to come back to Dublin with. And I was doing really well in that company, but I was kind of, I felt that they weren't ambitious enough for me. And I remember it kind of, you know, which is like I was 20, five or six or whatever yeah, and I was telling like the guys you know you guys gotta you know yeah. we gotta be like take on the world you know that, that was the way I was thinking at the time so there was a client of mine in London who um, I got friendly with and a position came up in their company and I said to him I'd love to come and work for you guys and he said come over so we kind of said I said to him my dream is to start up my own business and he said well maybe we can look at you becoming a part of this business if things work out so we did a kind of a trial period and then we kind of said, OK, we'll go our own kind of way. And I started up a company called Zip Marketing and they became my biggest client. And I started focusing on um, e-commerce companies, particularly companies based in Asia, primarily Hong Kong and Singapore. And I had client in Australia as well. And they would sell things online, things like an Amazon, really, you know, and so they needed someone on the ground in Europe who knew how to get them, you know, marketing promotions and open up channels and all that kind of side of it. So um, I would built up a lot of expertise in that area and I was able to kind of, you know, do deals with the maybe someone like McDonald's and McDonald's maybe would uh, with every value meal you would get a voucher to spend on, on this particular website and that kind of thing. And those kind of promotions really started taking off and I would do advertising deals on their websites and help them to get more customers and to try and make more money off their customers and make customers think that they needed to get more CDs and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I did that and it was going really, really well. Zip marketing was doing really well. And um, the idea of becoming a priest would kind of come back to me. In the midst of this, you're making money, like good money. I was doing very well. Living yeah. the high life in London. Yeah, it's probably my dream. My with dream, some important guys like ambition. Like if you have ambition and you study, like you're probably. Like I wanted take it to. Off. I wanted to do well. Not like my dream was to go. You know, the bright, the bigger the city, the the more I wanted to go there, and the higher the mountain I wanted to climb. And so, was doing really well. You know, I started going into prop. I had a lovely apartment in a really expensive area in London, and then I was. I had a, a house and apartment in Cork and I was, you know, money I was getting, I was investing it in property and, but it was empty inside for Luke. You know, I was, I was traveling a lot. I was going all around the world. Um, and people, you know, some people, you know, in London who I was kind of mixing with, you know, were looking at me and thinking, wow, you're doing really, really well and you're really, really happy. And, but I was really insecure. I was trying, I'm, I was really motivated and really ambitious. And I was, you know, reading every book on like Bills and whoever, you know, had done really well in business to try and become like that. But I was doing it for others. I was doing it so that people would think it was great. You know, that that's, I can see that so clearly now. Um, so to be free of that now is, is a great, great thing, yeah. you know. Um, but like that monkey on your back that you're you're living just for others really you know to try and impress people and for people to say wow he's doing really really well 
So the idea of becoming a priest would have uh, come to me every now and again. But I didn't really have a reason to become a priest. You know, I'd never met a priest who inspired me. I, I wouldn't have known about the same would now. I'd never really read up much about the faith. I was going to Mass on Sundays, uh, probably out of fear of what might happen if I didn't go, you know. A lot of times I was, you know, falling asleep in, in Mass or whatever. Um, so my heart wasn't kind of in it, but I was kind of hedging my bets a bit. I was kind of like keeping one foot, you know, um, trying to stay close to the Lord for fear of what might happen if I didn't. Um, but even in those days, I remember, you know, looking back, even Our Lady's protection, you know, because I would have prayed the rosary a lot when I was in my teens with, with my my father and my mother. The three of us would have been in the house. Um, but in my 20s, I kind of drifted away. I was you know, going to Mass on Sundays, but that was pretty much it. So I remember thinking, I had a girlfriend at the time, I was 28 or so, and I remember saying to her, you know, I might have a vocation to the priesthood. <laughs> <laughs> she found her man, though. She's got the money. He's, you know, he's doing all right. <laughs> well, I, I, and I said, I need to check it out. I need to find out one way or another if this is real, you know, because I don't want to be like in my 70s and think, you know, I never gave this a shot. And it's still with me all these years later. I, re I remember being in, in UCC, Father Luke, and saying to myself one day, you know, about being a priest, because it would, would come to me, not like, you know, I mean, you know what it's like, it's not like every minute of every day this is on your mind, but it, it, you get these kind of reminders and um, maybe kind of like, you know, when you fall out with someone and you kind of get these reminders, you know, you should ring them or make up with them and you kind of, you don't, you don't do it and it yeah. just, it doesn't go away. You know, you should do this. So kind of had of feelings. Um, and I remember kind of saying, well, sure, if it's to be, it'll be. And I'll get on with my life and sure if it's to be, will it be? So it kept coming back to me. And I remember saying to this girlfriend, I have to check this out. So I could finish the relationship. And I remember going to visit a priest in London and thinking that, you know, in the space of five minutes, he could tell me if I had a vocation or not, and I could get on with my life or, or not. And he couldn't, he didn't really, you know, guide me in the way that I wanted him to. <laughs> so then I went to another priest and then I went, to, and then I started getting more confused. You know, I would advise anyone who's thinking about vocation to choose one priest and try and work it, you know, with a spiritual yeah. director instead of trying to get loads yeah. of different opinions, which just confuses you even more. So um, my father, three years previously, had given me a present and the diary of St. Faustina. And in my apartment in London, it was up on the shelf, covered in dust, never been opened. And I decided one day to have a look at this. I was blown away. I mean, I was just, you know, the, have you have you have you read the diary? I have, yeah. So, you know, just this intimate relationship she has with the Lord. She comes back into a room and the Lord is sitting down and, you know, it's just it's amazing. And you get these insights into the Lord and what, what he's teaching her about obedience and just blew my mind, you know. Um, but what really struck me was the love Jesus had for me, you know, and that he came and died especially for me. I never really thought about that and how I had kind of abandoned him and been lukewarm for so long and more interested in the things of the world and got caught up in, in all that. And... I basically fell in love with the Lord. I mean, that's that's what happened because, you know, I had feelings for girls I was in relationships with, but this was like at a whole different level. And my life changed. I found treasure. I found treasure in a field, you know, and um, I was at the point then where, you know, then I started going to mass every day and I started, you know, I was on the tube in London and I'd be like praying the rosary and I was just, I couldn't do it. You know, it was just like on fire, you know, I just, he was giving me so much honey, so much consolation. Um, all I wanted to do was talk about the Lord and all I wanted to do was tell people about God's love because I had found peace and, and happiness. And when I was, you know, in business and all that, I thought I was happy. I didn't know I was unhappy. I didn't know that I was really insecure. I didn't know that I was living in a goldfish bowl. I didn't know I was living my life to impress others. I was a slave, you know. I was. But when I found this new level, this just 
blew my mind and um, things just started making sense for me and uh, I had peace in my heart and it was funny because when you don't have peace you kind of you don't think oh, wait a minute I don't have peace you it's it's only sometimes when you actually get it you realize what you didn't have so it was a case then of um what do I do how do I tell people about God's love so I remember someone approached me knowing that I was in business and they had a very successful uh, successful apostolate reaching many many people around the world and he he wanted to retire so he saw me and he said listen what keep your business going and you can do this I'll give you an office the whole thing you can do your business from because that was one of the great things with my business um I was able to work virtually, you know, I was, um, as long as I had a kind of an internet connection. So I started thinking about that and I went to visit a monk in a monastery and I was telling him and he said, you've got to become a priest. He said, he, like, what you can do as a priest is so much more than you can do. And I was like, he's right. I need to become a priest. I need to tell people about God's mercy, about God's love, about the hope there is, about the peace you can have in your soul. Um, and so the call had been there, Father Luke, but I didn't have a reason to become a priest. Now it came together. And then I decided to join the seminary. An interesting thing happened. I decided on March the 19th, um, the Feast of St. Joseph, and that my father had died previously. Uh, that was 2008. My father had died January 2007. And that had been a really kind of profound experience for me as well because I was just at his bedside praying wow. Chapel of the Divine Mercy, Chapel of the... He was on a, a ventilator in the ICU for 18 days. So I was praying and praying and that really kind of brought me on another level as well. And from all I'd learned from the Divine Mercy diary, I was just praying chaplets and chaplets. But so about, what, 15 months later, I made this decision in March uh, 2008. And I didn't even know it was the Feast of St. Joseph. Right, because you know, I wasn't reading a lot about the faith at the time, and yeah, so it was only when I told someone two weeks later, a priest, that uh, you know, I've decided to join the seminary, he was like, That's the feast of St. Joseph, do you know that? And then I said, You know what? At Christmas time, I was praying with my mother because I moved back from London to after my dad died to stay with my mother, um, and we used to pray together and we took St. Joseph out of the crib. We were saying, you know, we never prayed to St. Joseph and we put him up on the kind of little altar we had. And then that was a Christmas. And then March 19th, I make the decision. And I'll never forget it after. I just, I just said to the Lord, Lord, I do believe you're calling me and I'm going to say, yes, this is it. And I'm going to go for it. And this supernatural peace came over me. I'll never forget it. It was like the Lord saying, finally, you know, finally, you're... Wow. Finally, you've uh, you've listened to me, and that was a tremendous confirmation for me, Father Luke. And um, then I, you know, then it was a case of where do, where do I go? You know, so I decided to to join the the diocese of Cork and Ross. You said a lot of things in there. I think for for me, like the first reason I really wanted to get you here is because I think we're in the times now where the priest, the image of the priest, has to be put out there for what he is, like because it's been. Obviously, I think it's an obvious one, like to attack the priest, to disfigure the priesthood. Yeah. And in the context of Ireland, a lot of people I don't think would have reason for um, hating a priest. You know, they wouldn't personally have a reason. There are some people that do, that have experienced something. But what we're seeing, and I'm just talking on a secondary school level, like, you had experience in, in UCC as a chaplain. We'll get to that after. But like on our secondary school level with this is, you know, you're talking 13 year olds to, to 17, 18 year olds. Mm. We've seen it across the board in the all boys school. And we've seen it in the girls school as well, that they have a very bad image of a priest. And um, I'm speaking of a context in Ireland. I, I wouldn't, you know, in the States, I wouldn't be able to say that like personally I've been you know gone for so long in Spain it's kind of like black or white like, they can say in Spain they can spit on you or kiss your hand it's just basically the Spanish would be you know but like here I have seen it's very heavy like this negative image of a priest yes. um, I want like I think for us like, we need to get just to just bring a bit normality back into it because like it's mm -hmm. you, you you just described a really normal life 
like there's nothing there that's like out of the ordinary like i would love for people to hear that you know for to share this and to send it on so that like a young person can see that this is just this is normal like up until now everything's normal your dad gives you a book it's funny how an instrument like a book you're you know obviously god's working here you read what you need to read and it just it hits you but like you said that you you've had girlfriends and you've experienced the love like you know that you can have like Mm -hmm. with a girlfriend but that has nothing to do with it like the experience that you had with the love of Christ that right there for me is is huge and for someone to just even like think of that concept that like you know that our hearts can get to that that level of intimacy mm-hmm. with God and our relationship with Jesus Christ and and then the amount that you can do bringing that to other people like for me just that right there is an image of the priest I think is already like huge really important so I mean and you did give up business you're not one of those guys that are like you got to like rock by me living under a bridge and like oh shout sure, I'll become a priest like see if there's something out there for me like you had it you had it going and then like he well, it, he brought you in it was interesting for the day after I made my decision so March the 19th right March the 20th I had to go to London because I still had the business and I had to kind of I decided instead of selling it I would just kind of maybe help the clients I had to bring people on board to do what I was doing right so I had to go over to London back and forth quite a bit. And I was in a hotel March the 20th and I got two phone calls in the morning. So I'd made my decision to become a priest. Yes, Lord, this is what you're... And he gave he gave me this tremendous uh, confirmation, this piece. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine in London who was telling me that there's a, a chain of restaurants in... And it was Austria and Germany, fish restaurants, tremendously successful, 400 of them, I think. And he wanted to bring the franchise to London. And he asked me, would I come on board as a partner? No, if he had rang me like a year before, I would have like bitten both his hands. I would have gone up to the shoulder, like, you know, (laughs) whatever, like, because I was so ambitious. And so, you know, not, not so much for money, but for just success and, and uh, to rush and a rush and that people think you're fantastic. Right. So I was able to say to him, you know, it's not for me right now. Right. And and that 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 wasn't like heroic at all because it was so easy. Yeah. It just didn't interest me anymore. You know, it was like someone saying to me, "Let's you know jump out of an airplane today." Like it just wasn't of interest to me anymore because I'd found the true tre- treasure. That's why the grace that God gives yeah. you, you know, it it wasn't me at all. Then a couple hours later or an hour later, or something, I get another call from one of my biggest clients who said that they wanted to make me a shareholder in the business to give me 15%. Now, this was a serious business, right? And, but they needed someone, because I'd been working with them for a few years in Europe, and they they saw that, you know, they they needed someone on the ground that they could try. They wanted to make me a business partner, give me 15%. This would have made me very, very wealthy, right? And I just was like, not interested. They were like, what's going on with you? You know, like, what's, what's, you know, they, they were, they thought I was like trying to maybe hold out for more because the, yeah. the, this was a different kind of Marius they were talking about, right? So, um, and it was just so easy for me to do. It just wasn't of interest to me. And the hardest thing for me, you know, in becoming a priest wasn't the, the celibacy or it was the business because that was my dream. And it was to leave aside what I had, you know, put sweat and tears into. Um, but it just became so easy for me. Just the Lord was like... <laughs> hose piping me with with grace you know um and just honey and it was just i was so full of consolation and um it just became an easy kind of decision you know, it's, am- it's amazing yeah no his timing and his he knows it but he had to get you because like i think there's a lot of people that because you were you did have a moment there where you're open thanks be to god that's what we have to pray for like first of all people like parents and everything continue to put instruments the book to continue to help the Lord because he's really trying to get in there. And then second of all, like open. So that was a grace in itself that you had that open door. So like after the priesthood, you've, you've done a number of things here. You were, is it eight years were you in UCC or is it? No, you're no, you're eight years a priest. Is it eight years? Well, nearly eight years a priest. Yeah. So I was, um, I've had two appointments. I was a chaplain in UCC for three years. University college. Cork. Cork. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just for the, people to get that but that's um all colleges in ireland are big party schools ucc would be up there college road um how does that work like a priest walking around i'm talking from secondary school experience like college experience unfortunately i haven't had enough of it but like 
what's that you're walking around a normal college campus as a priest so this was the place where i studied for four years and i partied for four years and i didn't go into the church for four years right because i was afraid and then the lord in his you know with his sense of humor sends me back into this place and i remember like people were kind of sympathetic towards me saying oh you're gonna get slammed in there you're like that's gonna be so hard you know and I remember reading, I think, Acts of the Apostles. Uh, you may recall Paul going to Corinth and he's really, you know, frightened and mm -hmm. Corinth was, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> it was Vegas a big, big city. Steroids, it was Vegas, yeah. Vegas of steroids. Yeah. So he's gone there and then the Lord says, I have many friends there too. And I read that and I was like, the Lord has many friends in UCC. So that was really consoling, that piece of scripture. So in I went and um, yeah, people were, by and large, very, very friendly towards me. We, I had a great time with the students. One of the things, I suppose, as a chaplain there, you've an awful lot of, you're, you're like a college employee, so you have to go to an awful lot of meetings, so you have a lot of administration, and that kind of takes away from the mission. That was probably the hardest part of it all, but with the students was just such a joy. I mean, we had the Catholic Society there, and we'd meet up, and we'd have... We discussed the UCAT and we'd students would prepare food for each other. And, you know, one of the most difficult things, I suppose, being on university campuses, it changes by the semester. You know, you could have loads of guys coming over from the States in one semester and then they're gone after three months and you're kind of starting all over again in some ways. But, yeah, it was just great working with them and, uh, you know, having great conversations. And, um, you know, I think something like 15 percent of the students in UCC were going to counselling. So there's a lot of sad kids there and there's a lot of kids coming from very troubled backgrounds and difficulties. So just to be a, just a gentle kind of listening voice there. And they really understood my function as well when it came to bereavement. Like we had some serious tragedies. So it's nice. go into, yeah, yeah, some terrible, I mean, like, um, like really traumatic experiences that happened that on campus. There. Yeah. They'd call the chaplain. And just like students who became really, really sick in, in ICU and so forth. Um, they really, the students union in particular, who people would think, you know, you're, you're going around like a priest like this, the student union who like would be, you know, on a completely different page, you would think. But when it came to these moments, they just really got where the priest uh, could play a part. And, you know, going to the hospital and the ICU and being with the family and all that. That was um, a role that really only the priest could yeah. could play. And, you know, we weren't looking at the time and conscious of that. We were there for the yeah. people. So um, it was a tremendous uh, experience and uh, very enriching. And the f my first appointment as a priest. And then from there it was the hospital. So, yeah, moved up the river uh, about 500 yards, the River Lee in Cork and went into the Mercy University Hospital, which is in the city centre. So it's an acute hospital. So we have like an A&E, an ED department. And, you know, you, you meet so many people in that hospital coming in every day. We have about 320 patients, but it's changing every day and even every hour. And there's different people coming into the emergency department. And so it's just been an unbelievably enriching experience. I've been there five years every day is different um every patient is different and i get so much from them they they teach me so much as well and when you meet someone who is in the midst of great great suffering and you experience the faith that they have in and that really really is inspiring or you meet people who really want to change their lives make profound confessions you notice know like as a priest when you you're you're a penitent yourself or when you when somebody really wants to change and it's just it's amazing i remember one time father luke there was a family they started running after me down a corridor one day and i was like oh what's going on here um you don't know as you, is it a good or a bad thing and they mm. said i forget now the exact details or, or the person's name but they said what did you say to our father yesterday i was like you know because you meet so many yeah. i mean i probably meet several hundred people every day including the employees 1500 people working there you know so every day you're going around the beds and you're meeting so many people you can't remember 
a lot of the detail you know you hear so many confessions you, you just, you just, so uh, and my poor brain wouldn't uh, <laughs> be able so they said what did you say to her and I, I didn't remember who they were talking about and then they said his name and I said uh, oh yeah I said I was with him yesterday they said what did you say to him and I kind of you know I couldn't remember and then they said well whatever you said to him he's a totally different man he's like full of peace and joy he's like happy he's like hugging us he's he's a totally different father like what did you say to him and then i remember he made a profound confession i didn't say anything i just was the, the lord's instrument and gave him absolution but he did all the heavy lifting and just you experience that a lot in hospital people really start to think about their lives and want to change and just to see this man whatever you know was going on i can't remember but his whole life changed and everyone benefited as a result yeah. of that. Well, look, working sacraments, like that's really the priest, like the priest is out there, like that one monk said to you, you know, you can be doing so much good and you know yourself, like you're an instrument of the action of of him, like, you know, using you. And I'm sure like he always delights when he has an instrument that will go, like and go places where he, he needs to be. So praise God. Um, there's loads of ministry here. Um, you've got... Exodus 90 this year, we had over 300 men doing the Exodus 90, the men's rosary, rosary on the coast, like the rosary on the coast. You're a huge promoter of the rosary. Totus Tuus uh, magazine. Um, I'm missing a big one here. Look, you're, you're like, you're, there's loads of projects you got here that you're, that, that you're doing. Um, what do you see as far as right now, like our situation in Ireland? Because we're used to like a lot of people like the whole point of these programs is to give hope like i, I want to give people hope that this is like that god is is working and that people need to s just disconnect from the world like the world is our enemy so the world is going to be telling us what the world wants to tell us and a lot of times it's it's lies that it's all over this country you lived you lived the referendum like you've seen this country go through two referendums mm -hmm. um you the ireland you grew up in the island now has been torn apart that being said, um, what would you see now as the context and what's going on and like what you're involved in? Like this is just like the, the injection of, of light and hope for the for people listening. I think we the 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 history here in Ireland of the faith is just immense. As you, I mean, as you've been here now for how long have you been here? Four, four years. years. Right? Four years. Wow. Yeah. And you go back to St. Patrick, and it's just the blessings this country has received is just it's unbelievable i mean there's are there any other countries in the world i don't know who've been blessed in the way ireland has been blessed and this way saint patrick has come and the faith spread and then the the, the monks leaving this country in the 600s primarily and going across europe and restoring the faith as far as poland and john paul ii when he came here in 1979 he wanted to visit clan mcnoise to give thanks to the, the monks who came all the way to poland and we preserved, you know, the land of saints and scholars. We preserved the faith here and preserved Latin. And so God has blessed this country in, in a way that very few have been blessed, I think. And the faith, the roots are deep, Father Luke, you know, the roots, the roots are deep. I remember the, after the, the referendum in 2018, wasn't it, the, um, when people um, voted to, abortion became legalized, became legalized here. I was in Knock the following day and I met a Scottish bishop, Bishop John Keenan. And he said to me, you know, he said, you have a remnant in Ireland that you don't have in any other country. Do you realize that? He said, that's 700,000 or whatever that voted. No, he said, you have something really powerful there. And that really struck me, you know, that even though there was a million and point three or whatever it was that voted yes, a lot of those people were confused too, you know, they just, it was the kind of, they just yeah. went with the, the way that the stream was going. Um, but the remnant here is strong and there are pockets of people all around the country um, who love the Lord, love the faith. Um, at the moment, we're doing rosary at the grottos, right? So asking people to pray the rosary at their grotto each day in May, right, at eight o'clock. Most of them are doing it at eight o'clock. Some of them are doing it, you know, at a different time. But there's over 250 grottos registered. Wow. <laughs> you know, like it's, there's grottos everywhere here. Ours I mean, just open here, Muddy Hill. It's, it's nice. They're everywhere. Yeah. 
and a lot of them came out in 1954, the Marian year. You know, you think of the all the missionaries who have left these shores over the last hundred years, gone all around the world. Remember an Argentinian priest telling me that it was an Irish priest who bought soccer to Argentina and they're everywhere. Remember really? the previous papal nuncio, Archbishop Charles Brown, who was from New York. He said when he was working in the Vatican that he, he had a job one time to bring a cardinal to um, Nepal or something and they went up like this mountain and you know like this tiny village on top of this mountain and this priest comes out and he says how are you how's it going like, <laughs> it's like an Irish guy. like everywhere the Irish the the influence the Irish have had and the church is just unbelievable so this country has been so so blessed I remember you know my mother telling me so many times about when she grew up like every family prayed the rosary it was like what every family did at, in the evening time. Father Patrick Payton, you read about him, the family rosary, you know, the family that prays together, stays together. He got that from his own family and he saw what was happening in Ireland and the faith of the people. Cromwell tried to destroy the faith here. You know, you've read about him, I'm sure, heard about him. And he said, they, you know, they hold up these beads. We, we can't we can't destroy it there. These fanatical Irish, he called them. Frank Duff, the Legion of Mary. There's something like seven, eight million Members of the Legion the of Mary biggest, around biggest kind. lay apostolate in yeah. the world or something, right? So this country, if it's tiny. We're like we're, we're talking now, there's about six million people, but you know, twenty, thirty years ago, it was like four and a half million or something. Like a lot of people have come here, and what God has done, like you're talking about a country the size of Slovakia, Estonia, Lithuania, you know, what God has done through these people is it's been unbelievable. So uh, the roots are deep, is what I'm saying. And we have a, a very strong remnant here. And when you kind of do things, people respond and they just need to be encouraged and a bit of leadership, I think. I and, yeah. you know, there's so many people out there and there's so many. Then there's another like maybe level below that of people who maybe are not practicing, but they're not far away. Yeah. And needs to be woken up and it's there's something in there as well. Sensibility. When we go through the schools, we kind of challenge the boys saying like in 10 years time they're not going to have mass in their parish anymore which to get really indignant and up in arms like they would probably go to easter and christmas but like the fact that they're not going to have a priest and a mass they're kind of you know it's the parish it's like yeah you know, really important we just say look guys demographic here in the diocese priests you know average age 70 parishioner same 10 years time i think life expectancy in ireland's 83 so we're just doing the math here. They're probably not going to be around. So the boys are kind of like indignant, but it's kind of like a, a vein that we're trying to, you know, to work there. And like, you know, it, like you said, I think it needs to be stoked. Um, the people who voted no, they need to be um, consoled. Like there's a consolation apostolate here as well yeah. to reaffirm them in just the gospel yeah. that they just want to hear the gospel, nothing else. And just like, I think console them with that. But uh, massive movements. The Irish Dominicans are taking off the CFRs, the home of the mother as well. We had a Holy Week encounter there, which just blew my mind. There's over 350 people at it. Yeah, it's like, praise God. Yeah. And it had to be stopped. Like, but just young families that wanted. Yeah. Just really nothing. Like, we weren't getting them special. Like, just the gospel. Sister Claire Crockett, Sister Ruth as well. Like, both of them. We, those are the two Irish sisters that we, we had die in our community. Like, there's seven Irish sisters. The first two to go were Irish out of, like... You're talking 180 plus sisters and the way they left and the, the impact they're having now, I just see it is the roots are deep, but like there's a presence here of our lady and our Lord that are saying, look, Ireland's not, yeah. it's not sinking on my watch basically. Like, and, and they're just, it's just, just coming. Like. And another sign as well, the spiritual attack on Ireland, right? I mean, it kind of became the epicenter of things in the world and then, you know, with the abortion referendum and this small little light, you know, why, why? So it's, what Ireland has done around the world, you know, what God has done through this country is is amazing. Hopefully, He'll do more of it in the future. Um, like we had all these missionaries in the last hundred years, and then so many of them in the six hundreds. And uh, will there be, you know, another wave of it? Who knows what? Who knows what will happen? But you're getting these signs, as you're saying, of these shoots that are emerging. And okay, vocations in general are not great at the moment. Um, but you and I meet a lot of guys who are searching. Yeah. You know, like it does, as someone said to me, it's all to pray for, you know, we, you know, we, we say it's all to play for, but it's all to, it's all to, it's yeah. all to pray for. It, it really, really is. And, um, and something I've been just attracted to so much is promoting the rosary because 
well, firstly, our lady asks us to pray the rosary and she it's like your your mom telling you to tidy your room. And then she says, you know, you know, maybe as, as another reminder and then another one. And our lady in Fatima, every single apparition, she's saying pray the rosary and that uh, she is the, the lady of the rosary. Um, so, you know, that's something I have uh, felt attracted to in particular. Um, Do you get that? So I need to turn it off. Yeah, we. There you go. It's fine. It's good. So a little interruption there. Some doesn't want me talking about <laughs> the okay? rosary. It's it happens, fine. happens quite a bit when I talk about the rosary. Um. So that we're steeped in Marian tradition here in this country as well. You know, so many women. Their names: Moira, Marie, Mary, Miriam. We have our own name in, in Irish for Our Lady Wira. You know, Skull of Wira, and it's a very popular name for school. Kolosh of Wira, etc. So I feel that um, we can attract a lot of people back to the faith through Our Lady's intercession and by praying the, uh, praying the rosary. Uh, very, very important, but also strengthening people. You know, um, I remember somebody telling me that their, their grandmother was on the, the Titanic as a 16 year old and um, managed to make it up onto the deck which a lot of the Irish didn't because they were on the, the lower level which the gates were shut because they thought they didn't have enough boats, right? Mm -hmm. But it was boat number 13, Our Lady's number. And what was everyone doing on the boat? They were all praying the rosary. And so, so many people now in Ireland are, are anxious, afraid, um, on the point of despair, really so many living in darkness. And we have the, the answer. You know, Jesus Christ is, the, is yeah. the answer. And Our Lady can bring people back to him. Um, and that's the thing, you know, we, we really like I was in marketing for many years. And so I was making people think that they needed something that they didn't. Right. I mean, that's what marketing kind of is. Right. You know, I was making people buy books when they didn't need to buy them because there was promotions and what have you and the tricks that you use and all that. And now we have the ultimate. We have the gospel. You know, we can actually help people bring hope into their lives um, bring light into their lives and help them to have meaning and purpose. And I was at a book launch yesterday. Another great thing, Father Chris Hayden has launched a book on the Catholic um, teaching on human sexuality. And he's basically saying to people that in, in saying, yes, this is tremendously, and you and I know this as priests, tremendously fulfilling and liberating. And they're being told the opposite, obviously, through the mainstream media and Hollywood and everything else. But... Uh, we have we we have the truth. We have a message of hope. We can really help people, and that's my my own hope for my own priesthood, Father Luke. Is that the treasure that I discovered that I can help other people discover that, and that they can come to a realization of God's love and mercy in the way that I did, and the profound impact it had on my life. Yeah, and everybody listening obviously is going to be keeping you in the prayers because this is an answer to prayers there's vocations there that like bosco john bosco said like there's vocations like god's calling it's just a lack of response so on our end people listening like we mentioned be an instrument like giving good books i've been promoting encino jesu as well not only for people great book yeah, yeah even for priests like that's that's been going to renew priests and if we get priests renewed you know that they're going to be doing what they should be doing and there's going to be you know more vocations it's really it all comes down to the priest and then yeah. it all comes down to his relationship with our lord and then that comes down to eucharistic adoration basically it just doesn't it's not that complicated <laughs> but like people listening obviously keep father marius and all your work in the prayers totus tuus that's a really great little um it's very attractive i like how you guys put it down to a smaller size and I like a little it's very handy and the rosary um here in ireland like in your grottoes get that grotto register is very easy and if there's just two people going to the grotto that's it people pass them on the road it's very apostolic i can see one person at a grotto and i get moved yes and i'm a yeah. priest but like you see someone there and it moves you and it gets you thinking so yeah. get to your grottos in the month of may pray the rosary pray for priests and um hopefully please god this will give a good message out to people like you know that maybe thought all was lost with Ireland, but it's yeah. not like he is working and he's still here. So. It's all to pray for. It it's is all yeah. to pray for. It is. It's all. It's all. And we've got a great remnant here. My goodness, that's right. You know, we really, really do. It's encouraging. And hopefully, if Irish listeners, viewers will will join us for the Rosary Rally, you guys are hoping to come as June well, right? June fourth. June the fourth. Knock from one thirty p.m. and um, we'll have the papal nuncio there and Bishop Michael Dignan as well. And 
I'm hoping to give a talk on the rosary as well. So love to see everyone there and let's rally for Our Lady. Let's rally for yeah. rally for Ireland. Yeah, that's where it starts. So thank you, Father Marius. If you want, maybe you can end with a prayer and your blessing. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. I ask you to bless everyone now who's watching and bless the, the brothers and the great work they're doing. We thank you for the gift of them to our country. Um, Sister Claire, Sister Ruth, who are interceding for us in heaven. And, you know, the, the five houses that the, the servant brothers and servant sisters have in Ireland, what a gift that has been to our country. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to help us to come to know your great love for us, that you are our Father, that you're close to us, and that you are the God of love and mercy. And we make this prayer now through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Knock, and all the angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God come upon you all, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Go you. in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thank you, Father. Alleluia. Praise God the bless, Lord. God bless, guys. Thank you. Thank you.